do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I love how the Bible captures God's work of bringing the new into existence. The old way of living is gone. A new way of living is here today. In 1961, when 72 people gathered in a basement talking about a dream and a vision God was stirring in their hearts, it wasn't to stay the same. Their prayerful desire was to believe for what could happen if they modeled to the next generation how the love of God could transform a city. From those humble beginnings, God's work has been evident for over 60 years. What began as 72 grew to hundreds, which grew to thousands. God has been faithful to pour out his grace and love on this city through Trinity Church, and much has evolved since those members first met. Our church transitioned, our city grew, and the world changed. And recently, God began to invite us to reconsider the story of what he's been doing from the very start, renewing, bringing in a fresh wind. And so began our journey as a faith community to revitalize the calling and focus God has for us today. It's not that our church has a calling for God, rather, God has a calling and invites us to participate in it. We are committed to continue and carrying that prayerful passion from 63 years ago, inviting people to courageously follow Jesus. We join God in his calling. And the church, our church is kingdom, participation, sacrifice, contribution. And when we purpose ourselves towards God in that way, lives and cities can't help but be transformed for the good. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to seek and save those who are far from him. As has been evidenced through so many who have gone before us, our most lasting legacy is equipping to empower the next generation. We need the expectation that God is not finished yet. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. How do we participate? We prioritize authenticity. We do life together. We serve others first. We live generously. We pursue God. We shape our lives to Jesus. And as we gather in prayer and worship, our hearts become united. And then together, motivated by love, we share the hope of Jesus with each other and the world. This is who we are. And we are believing for so much more. God is not done working in us and through us yet. Our prayer is that you will join us as we continue to follow the Holy Spirit's lead and live out the joy of his presence every single day. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Yes, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Yeah. You know, Philippians 2 reminds us that God gave Jesus the name that is above all other names, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow 
on heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That every tongue, every language will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, amen? Perché degno sei, Signor, perché degno sei, Signor, esiste tutto in te.
Blessed are those who run to him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. Blessed are those who seek his face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shamed.
Lord, all I am is yours. So I'll stand with all. possible for us to have life, for us to find hope, even today. Thank you, Jesus. So how else can we respond but to give you our thanks, to give you our gratitude, to give you our lives, to say, God, have your way. Do what you would do not only around me, but in me. We humble ourselves before you, the King of kings, the Lord of all, sovereign, powerful, 
in control, almighty Savior who heals, brings life, brings purpose. Spirit, do your work today around us and in us, we pray. In Jesus' powerful, life-changing name. Amen. Amen. We're going to celebrate some baptisms today on this Thanksgiving weekend. It's an opportunity to be, yeah, right? So as you find a seat, take a look at this video. I grew up with a, in a Christian household and I went to a Christian school and I kind of always just had this understanding that Jesus was just this kind of man in the sky, so to speak, who looked over us and watched over us and made sure we were safe. And he's someone that you could just like go to if you were like struggling or if you just want someone to talk to and you were feeling lonely, he was just someone that you would go to and just have a conversation with and he would always be there. I kind of felt like growing up, it was just something that we did. We went to church. It was just like, you know, it was just one of those things that it's like, oh, you go to school on the week and you go to Sunday school on Sunday. And then when I became 16, like during COVID, when church kind of stopped, our family stopped going to church. And then when I was 17, I went to my mom one day and I was like, I want to start going to church again. And that's when I was kind of like, this is my decision now. It's not because it's something we do. It's because it's something that I want to do. And it was kind of at that point when I was just like, I want, this is something that I want for myself and I want this relationship. I don't want it to just be something that is almost like a chore. It's something that I look forward to and it's something that, you know, is for me. Throughout high school, I like had some social issues sometimes and there was moments when I just felt really alone and really isolated. And it was in those moments that I would turn to God when I felt like I had nobody else and I was just like, He's not just a man in the sky anymore, he's a friend. Like he's someone who's always here, he will always listen to me, he'll always be here for me. And it was kind of then when I was like, I really believe in him and it's like I can just see the way that when I pray, like all my angst and all my worry just like leaves and flees my body. It was a continual journey. There was definitely moments like um, when I would feel really isolated and I would just like, step out of the situation, whether it was like a classroom or a sports event, or I would just step out and like go be by myself for a minute and go outside. And I would just sit there and pray. And it was really moments like those. Like sometimes I'd be in tears and I would just get up and leave and I would go outside and I'd just be like, God, I just need you to be here for me. And I could just kind of feel him like wash over me. When I look around and I have nobody else with me, I always have God and he'll always be there with me. And he's not gonna abandon me and leave me alone. I publicly declare that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Shay, thank you for sharing your story with us. Uh, we just sang a song called The Stand and you're taking a stand today in front of a room full of people <laughs> uh, to say that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And what you shared in your story is absolutely true that he is always with you, that you are never alone. Uh, and our community is blessed by the way that you've shared your faith and your story. And this is a beautiful step in your faith journey alongside your mom today, uh, which is so special. And so based on your profession of faith, uh, it is my joy to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I grew up in a house with a, a Christian mother and sort of very young age, I accepted Jesus in my heart and I never, still to this day, have ever not doubted who he was, if he's real. For me growing up, like church was mandatory, like everything, it was like, there was a lot, it was a lot of no's. I was like, I almost felt different from everyone. I went to public school, I almost felt like kind of embarrassed that I had a different life than everyone. Everyone got to do all these things and I didn't. And, and I think when I was at the age where I could make my own decisions, I just wanted to be the same as everybody else and just do all the things that everybody else did. The turn in my life was when I became a mom and I realized that it's the, it's like 
everyone can have a child, but it's up to me to guide these children. And that is, that's the most important job I've ever, ever been given in my life. And I, all I want for my kids is their eternity. I've told them that since the day they were born. I'm like, if anything ever happens to me, just follow Jesus. And I know my job has, I've done my job. So that has been the biggest thing for me. Even with choosing the school they went to, I wanted them to just, I wanted to help them at home, but I wanted to just give them that environment where Jesus was instilled in them. God and Jesus are so faithful. Through the course of my whole life, you know, and it's kind of ebbed and flowed with my level of faith, it's just the one constant thing in my life is my relationship with Jesus. He's never failed me. He's always been there for me. So many unanswered prayers, so many times in my life where I wanted something so bad that I thought it was the right thing for me. And that feeling of disappointment when it didn't work out for me, he always had something better in store for me. The biggest reason I'm here getting baptized is it's something I've wanted to do for a long time, but Shayla's like love for Jesus has been such an inspiration to me. And you know, when we come to church and we see all these baptisms, she just said, mom, I want to do that. And I thought, what an amazing opportunity to be able to do that with my daughter. Um, it's like actually probably the reason I haven't done this is it just kind of seems scary to be in the spotlight and be on my own. And I felt a majority of my life, my personal faith has been very like, just me. It's, I've always kind of felt like alone in it and to have someone to like come to church with and just pray with and be alongside of me has just been, it's like literally been an answer to prayer. It's exactly what I needed in life and it kind of gave me the right tool to just push me in the right direction. So I really thank my daughter for her faith and wanting to do this with me. I am here today to publicly declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and I will follow him forever. Well, Rianne, this is a beautiful, beautiful moment uh, and a long time coming. And you have been so intentional about uh, not only your own faith, but about passing that faith on to your kids, to your daughter. Um, and then what I love is the way that that now, that Shayla's faith is now inspiring and strengthening and encouraging yours. And so um, that's for my, my prayer for you guys as you continue to journey forward. But this is uh, your moment where you're going, hey, I want everybody to know that um, I'm following Jesus, I'm all in. And so uh, based on your profession of faith, uh, it is my absolute honor to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My parents didn't make me go to church or anything. Um, I mostly learned about God through other kids around me. And it was, you know, God was a, a man in the sky who was judging everything and I was gonna get in trouble. That was, that was what I saw God as. When I was 19, I tried to take my life and I was saved. I ran 100 feet off a cliff. I didn't break any bones, wound up in a wheelchair, but I remember, very clearly that there was something talking to me, something I couldn't describe what it was or what it said exactly, but I I know that there was something bigger than me, you know, and it must have been God uh, or an angel, that I wound up waking up in the hospital a few days later and I, I could remember that I'd gotten this message that there's so much more to life than what I'm doing and because I wasn't really in a religious mindset or a Christian mindset, I kind of thought of it as like a nightmare and like nothing's real and all that. And it did. So after that, after being getting this message of I need to change my life, I I wound up, uh, you know, dance, dancing with the devil for a while. And my friends, I have a good friend who's who's very faithful and he told me the greatest trick the devil can play on you is that he's not real. And he definitely had me fooled. And I wound up crying in, um, in a shower alone and just begging God that I didn't even really believe in at the time for help. 
And I woke up and I knew exactly where to go and what to do. Yeah, I just could start feeling the Holy Spirit during worship. That was when I would really start feeling it. And I knew I wanted to believe, but I didn't know if I could. And all I had to do was open the Bible and start reading. And once I read it, I knew. I accepted my faith for the first time when I started reading the book of Matthew and the following Gospels. Uh, I knew I believed every word because as soon as I read about it in the Bible and how, even how Jesus himself wanted to be baptized, I was like, I, well, I want to do that too, right? Like, I, I want to be a part of this. Well, I'd like to thank my friends Pat and Jordan who have helped me in my journey and this chapter of my life and helped me with understanding God and learning about faith. Yeah, I'm here today to declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and that I'm going to be following his teachings for the rest of my life. Well, Alex, I'm uh, so honored to be able to walk this uh, path with you of faith and be part of your journey. Uh, you're really inspiring to me. I love the way that you love and dive into scripture. And uh, it gives us great pleasure in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> that guy's here. All right, everyone, let's stand together and celebrate what Jesus has made possible for every single one of us. Actually, one more that we're gonna celebrate. Just kidding, have a seat. <laughs> There's nothing here. better than more baptisms, so. Over to you, Sarah. Everybody up for one more? I think so. Yeah. Um, guys, this is Emma and her small group leaders, Jenna and Sherry. Hi, everybody. So Sherry is my mom and I. We've known Emma for a lot of years, about eight years now. Um, I still remember the first time she came to youth and often I look back at the pictures and cringe because we're just little pipsqueaks back then. Um, but it's been amazing knowing you, Emma, all these years. And one of the stories that I always think about when I think about you, Emma, is um, I remember one time you came to me and you said, Jenna, I just like to go on walks and talk to God. And I remember thinking in that moment that, you know, Emma, Emma gets it. Emma gets that this is about her and God and, and their relationship together and, and you knowing him. And, um, and at youth lately, we've been talking a lot about courage and what it means to have courage and to know that uh, we can have courage because God is trustworthy. And when I think about your story, Emma, and when I think about courage, um, yeah, when I think about your story, I think about courage because you have such a courageous story. And um, yeah, and we, we know and have gotten to witness the amazing story of your life and how you've, you've trusted God and, and had courage because of him. So that's amazing. So we're really excited to be here with you today. So Emma, um, have you decided to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Yes. And do you declare that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes. All right, so we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Anyone else? No. Right. Let's stand together, come on. Who takes away 
You know, as, as uh, we consider what God has already been doing in our service today, as we see how he has stepped in to people's lives and changed their stories through the act of baptism, inviting them into that, as we sing songs to him of gratitude in multiple languages that are a declaration from the heart of who God is, he always invites us. He always says, hey, no matter your story or your situation or your circumstance, you're invited. And no matter your story, your circumstance, or your situation, you're invited to meet with him, to discover him. And one of those ways we do that in church is through communion. It's through celebrating the bread and the cup. And if you want to grab your cup right now, I encourage you to do that. You know, on the night Jesus was betrayed, I'm pretty sure it didn't sound like a lot of little lids getting ripped off. I'm <laughs> Matter of fact, I know it wasn't. Because the Bible tells us what happened on the night that Jesus was betrayed. And it was actually in the context of another supper that he was having with his disciples. And I can only wonder what the conversation was. Maybe they were talking about what had happened last week, or maybe they were talking about the future, Maybe they were kind of cracking jokes with each other. I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know. But Paul, in the book of Corinthians, records something. He records a firsthand account of what happened. And there's a, there's a line that he describes that actually kind of shakes me down a little bit. He says, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he prayed, prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. Think about that. The disciples didn't know what Jesus was about to do. Jesus did. And Jesus knew what was going to come in the hours and the days ahead, which was his betrayal, his torture, his death, and ultimately his resurrection, what we just sang about. And yet Jesus takes a moment to pray a prayer of thanksgiving to the Father, knowing what he was going to walk through. And I sat there and read that this week, and I was so overwhelmed on Thanksgiving weekend that here's Jesus, knowing what was going to happen to him, and his posture was gratitude, was honor, was lifting up the name of the Father. And so I wonder, no matter your circumstance or story today, I wonder as we approach the communion table, is there something you're thankful for? (laughs) Is there something in your heart that you can just lift up to God and go, God, I'm so grateful for what you've done, for who you are, for how you've changed my story, how you've invited me in. So I encourage you just for a moment to just share that gratitude with God right now. Just tell him what it is in the quietness of your heart to say, God, I'm so thankful for this. Would you take that moment now? Paul tells us that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he looked at his disciples and after praying a prayer of thanksgiving, he said, this is my body. It's going to be broken for you. So take it and eat it and remember me. And in a posture of gratitude, Jesus then grabbed the cup. And I'm sure in a moment of wonder for the disciples, he said, this is, this is going to be a symbol of what I'm about to do. And that is, I'm going to pour my blood out for you. It's, it's a new way, a new covenant, a new way of living, a Jesus way. And I'm going to do it for you and for us. So as you drink this cup and remember Jesus, do it 
with a heart of gratitude. Would you pray with me? Jesus, there's honestly no words we can express to say thank you for what you did for us thousands of years ago. God, through Jesus, you redeemed our story. You redeemed our situation. You redeemed every circumstance and you gave us promise and hope that as we just saying, there's nothing that can hold you down. There's no enemy, there's no situation. There's nothing that can get in the way of us experiencing your love because of the way Jesus made. So Jesus, we are grateful this morning. Father, we open our hearts and our hands to your love and Holy Spirit, would you come alongside us in peace and courage and confidence this morning? We pray this in the very precious name of Jesus and everybody said, amen. No enemy can hold you down cause there's nobody in the grave now. One head gets to wear that crown Cause there's nobody in the grave now No enemy can hold you down Cause there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown You can take a seat. That's that. Man, thank you so much for singing this morning and for uh, spending that time investing in that and praying with us and celebrating. What great promises we just sang about. No, isn't that true? Yes, come on now. I need an amen. That's, fan- that's fantastic. You know, uh, my name is Scott. I'm one of the pastors here. If we haven't met you, I just want to just welcome you here on Thanksgiving Sunday. We always have uh, such an, a great time together on weekends, uh, each and every week. But on these ones like Thanksgiving and Easter and, and Christmas, there's just a different sense of, of God showing up in some meaningful ways and welcoming us to consider him in some, in some different ways. And we've been part of this Blueprint series and we've been talking about our way of being, which is just some values that we want to uphold. And, you know, as we thought about this Sunday, we thought about the baptisms and the stories and, and just celebrating the different uh, diversity that God has given to us here at Trinity. 
And, and my heart was led to a passage that, that was really kind of the beginning of the first church and, and what they stepped into. And you can find it in Acts chapter 3 if you want to join along. But it's the story of, of Peter and John. And it says this in Acts chapter 3 verse 1. It says, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, the temple was kind of up a mountain, and, and regularly, three times per day, Jewish people would go for prayer. They would go to the temple, and in the temple, they would, they would have their prayers, and it was the kind of common rhythm of Judaism. And even though the disciples had followed Jesus, and he brought in a new kingdom in a new way, they still kind of maintained those traditions. After all, they'd spent the majority of their lives doing so, and almost like it was second nature, and so the text tells us that Peter and John were going on their way. They had a plan. They had an, a, an agenda. They were going somewhere important. They were going to pray at the temple. And then it says this. Now, now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. This eyewitness account of the story lets us know a man born with some sort of physical limitation, unable to move in any way by himself, was being assisted by some friends. Carefully, they would place him outside the temple gate to beg every single day. At temple, three times a day, there would be this rush of people going for their prayers, going to do what every good Jewish person is going to do because they were supposed to do that. And I am certain many of them would be the same people passing by, perhaps dropping off a few dollars. And there he would sit by what was called the beautiful gate. The Jewish historian Josephus described this gate as made of Corinthian brass, which meant it was costly. He records that the gate was 75 feet high with these massive double doors. It was massive and magnificent as the temple should be. Can you picture it? A seven-story tall gate meant to overwhelm and amaze people walking through it and this lame, immobile man just lying on the ground. The dichotomy here is significant. The beautiful and the broken. Every day, people were going to church right past this man to do the church thing. That's what you're supposed to do. And yes, almsgiving or giving to the poor was required as part of the Jewish faith, so I'm sure some would drop off a few coins, maybe just enough to sustain him. Yet, apparently in his entire lifetime, no one went beyond giving him a few denarii. I don't know about you, but I've been to a number of third world countries from Mexico to Bolivia, and you actually see a large number of individuals begging for money. I'm sure some of you have experienced it too. Often there's, there's so many people asking for money, there's, there's no way an individual could respond to all of them. The solution, if you've been like me, is just not to see them at all. But those begging make this difficult. It's been their way for much of their lives. And so if they're mobile, they kind of press themselves against you or they, they kind of put out their hand in front of you or they approach you uh, because at an intersection where you can't leave and they tug at your sleeve and they plead for help and those that aren't mobile just sit there and call out for help. And you could concentrate on not seeing them as they converged on you as you hurried to get through the section before you were trapped. And often because you had an agenda or somewhere to go or most often because it's just too hard to handle. Because <laughs> there's so many of them. What can I do? Well, the text tells us in verse three that when Peter and John were about to enter, this man did that very thing. He asked them for money. As he is being carried to the position of the gate, the text tells us, he observes two men nearby about to go in the temple. And maybe he knew they were disciples, or maybe it was just happenstance at that moment. Whatever it was, they were prospects. And instinctively, he calls out, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. Can you give a lame man some money? You know, interesting, uh, later on in the book of Acts, we find out this physically challenged man was over 40 years old. Year after year after year, he had been begging at the gate. Alms for the poor. 
decades. He was a fixture. Think about it. That means that likely Jesus, who we are told ministered at the temple, passed him too. (laughs) This man would have seen Jesus, and Jesus would have seen this man. I don't know. Maybe the crowds drowned Jesus out. Maybe, maybe he just didn't shout loud enough when Jesus walked by. It, maybe, maybe it just was too difficult. But it can seem a little confusing when you think of that, can it? Like, why wouldn't have Jesus already healed him? He's outside the temple. Why wouldn't this happen? I, I, I don't know. Have you ever felt like God just walked by you? You ever felt like God showed up late? Didn't hear? Didn't pay attention to your crying out day after day after day? Luke, the author of Acts, was a physician. And in his storytelling, he, he had an eye for detail. Now, he could have said, this beggar sat outside the temple, yet he was specific about the spot, the gate, the beautiful gate. In the original language, the Greek, what this text was written, the word beautiful actually means this. It means belonging to the right hour or season. It carries the sense of of timely, thereby signifying ripe or perfectly developed. Stay with me here. Only a few weeks earlier in Acts chapter 1, we're told that Jesus was about to ascend into heaven. But just before he did that, he he promised his followers, disciples that were there around listening and watching him ascend, that they would never be left alone, that the Holy Spirit would fill them with gifts and courage and resilience, direction, peace, and power. He says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, To his disciples, he says, when I leave, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to provide something. I'm going to provide you dynamite power that's going to be with you so that people from here and there and down the block and down the country and around the world will be able to understand and see who I am and what I'm all about. And about 10 days later, it happened. In Acts chapter 2, it's recorded like this. It said, when Jesus had left and the day of Pentecost came, they, the disciples, saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This this experience happened just like Jesus said, that he was going to leave them, but not leave them alone. And he said, the Spirit's going to come in power. And they saw the power firsthand as they started speaking in different tongues and different people understood different languages. And, And the point is, if the gospel, the message of Jesus was to move forward, it was going to require his followers to do it. Jesus had just left their everyday lives. They were so used to walking his path and hearing his voice and watching his way. And Jesus said, it is a brand new day, ladies and gentlemen. People following the Jesus way, learning and responding to the presence and power of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And I just wonder, as Luke describes that beautiful gate, that timely moment, I wonder if Jesus knew that the divine appointment was for Peter and John, not himself. I wonder, as this was the very first miracle of the early church, that he needed people to witness firsthand what God could do through ordinary people. As a matter of fact, after Acts chapter 4 says, the people were always amazed at Peter and John, these uneducated, these ordinary men that they had been with Jesus. And so I just wonder... As Jesus walked by every day and he saw that man, he says, oh, just hold on, fella. It's going to be amazing. I wonder if Jesus just looked at him and said, oh, you have no clue what's happening. I wonder if Jesus had that twinkle in his eye and the guy knew it, but he just never knew it was going to be these ordinary, these uneducated disciples who had never done a miracle before. I wonder, don't you? Verse four says, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, Look at us. And so the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And it makes sense because the beggar called out, but it was almost like he didn't expect anything to happen. After all, he's not yet reached his station and they're already out of his territory. And I wonder if the beggar hardly looked up for he simply expected to be ignored. 
And why did it matter anyway? All he wanted was some denarii. Yet this was different. Peter and John were walking in step with the Spirit. The prophetic was starting to happen in their hearts. They're, they're trying to listen for the whispers of the Spirit. They, they heard the Spirit's nudge. They knew it was time. Look at us. And the courage and the confidence and the power of understanding. Then Peter says in verse 6, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, brother, stand up and walk. Okay, I got to be honest. Every time I read that verse, all I can think of is growing up on the prairies going to Sunday school. Can anyone relate to this? You know, if you're like me, you had a teacher in Sunday school that was either completely annoyed college student who didn't want to be there, or it was an extremely cranky older lady who actually wore a cardigan and needed a breath mint. I don't know if that was you, but that was me. Uh, and, and, and there was this song that we would sing in Sunday school each and every week, especially the story. It was, silver and gold have I not, but such as I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Anyone else with me on that? And we're walking and leaping. And, yeah, you got that? That's exact. You know the story. I, every time I read this, that's all I think. I'm like walking and leaping and praising God. And I think of breath mint. I don't know why I think about it. That's what happens. But you cannot, you cannot get lost in an old Sunday school song. You can't just read by this on Thanksgiving. Oh, I've heard that story before. You cannot underestimate its power. There is power in the name of Jesus, the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. That's the power of the name of Jesus. We just sang about it. There is no enemy that can hold you down because there's nobody in the grave now. There's one head that gets to wear the crown because there's nobody in the grave now. No enemy can hold you down. So light of the world, lamb that was slain, lion who rose, mighty to save, the fullness of God won't be kept in a grave. Darkness, your hour is over. That's the Jesus we serve. We know the one we follow, who is the way, the embodiment of truth, and the source of life. And so we speak hope and faith into people, because why? The gospel offers a new day. We can't miss the point. Our highest calling is awakening to the presence of Jesus in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. What I do have, I give you. Peter's life had been transformed by Jesus. God used Peter to heal this man because people needed to see and understand the power of Jesus. Even if Peter never did it yet, he felt that inkling and that inspiration, that whisper of the spirit, and he was about to do something he's never done before, but he believed in the power of the name. And then Peter, it says in verse seven, took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet and began to walk. This paralyzed man had zero faith for his healing. The best he hoped for was a little money. He did not get money. He got a brand new life because speed, Peter stepped in to have faith on his behalf. I know you don't have it, buddy, but I've got it today. And I'm stepping on faith because I've never done this before. I've never seen this before. Any human but Jesus do this. But I'm willing to try it and step out and believe for what God wants to do through me. And then it says then, walking and leaping and praising God. This man went into the temple with him and all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate. They were absolutely astounded. This is what happens when someone encounters the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. And there's a word that just actually explodes off the page here. It, it, it's this word, leaping. And in the original language, it actually means to spring up, to, to gush up. The, the Greek word is halomai. And it only occurs three times in the New Testament, and it's equivalent in the Hebrew only five times in the Old Testament. And one of those occurrences in is, is in Isaiah chapter 35, a passage focusing, don't miss this, 
A passage focusing on when the Holy Spirit comes on God's people and what might happen. You know, a pastor friend of mine from the coast captured this so beautifully and, and it inspired my words today. I was so overwhelmed by it and I said, I have to share this with you. In Isaiah chapter five, it reads like this. It says, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The, the glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the, the splendor of God. Don't miss that. It says when, when God's spirit comes down onto this parched land, this, this community, this, this world we're living in in 2024 with, I don't know if you know any people that are, are dry. I don't know if you know any circumstances that need an investment of God's hope and and blessing. I don't know if you got a friend or a family member that's been through a circumstance that feels like they're on dry ground. And Isaiah tells us that when the Holy Spirit, when, when God's people step into it, the, the desert and the parched land will be glad, the, the wilderness will rejoice, and, and water will spring out, and joy will come. And then he says this. And then he says, when, when God's people step into this world, they, they will strengthen the feeble hands. They will Steady the knees that give away. They will say to those fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come, and he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. When the people of God come, and, and we use the gifts that God has given us, we use the, the purposes he's around us, the, the neighborhoods we're involved in, the, the school hallways we walk down, and, and we walk in, we say, don't fear, don't fear. Because I believe in a, in a name that has power. I believe in a God that wants to meet you, a God that wants to use you. Don't fear. I know it seems overwhelming, but I want to bring some hope. I, I know your hands feel weak. I, I know your knees have been on the ground praying so much, and, and you just felt lost and without hope. But I believe in a God who does not lack in hope, whose perfect love casts out all fear. And then Isaiah says this in verse 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unplugged. And then those who are lame will leap like a deer. And those who cannot speak will shout for joy. And water will go, gush out into the desert and streams will gush out into the wilderness. Can you see it? Can you feel it? Can you understand it? That when Peter and John were at that beautiful gate, at that divine moment, at that right time, and when they stepped into what God wanted to do through them, and, and, and they, they, they took the courage and the act of faith, that all of a sudden when, when Peter reached out and the lame man was healed, he couldn't help but leap. He couldn't help but have that water gush out of him that the Holy Spirit has come down and streams are filling his soul and all I wanted was money and I just got a brand new life. people. This is why the church exists. We reach out to be a conduit of Jesus' power, hope, and healing. We are living in responsive obedience to the Holy Spirit, using the gifts he's given us to do what God has prepared for us to do. We're all part of the priesthood, the mission God has called us to. And why? Because our world is desperate for it. That is why we're inviting you to courageously follow Jesus. That's why we say we prioritize authenticity. We, we do life together. We serve others first. We live generously because we pursue God and we shape our lives around Jesus because that's what he invites us to do. We're the ones bringing water to a desperately dry desert. And it can't just be a percentage of us who just feel like we just need to attend and receive and consume. It takes each and every one of us engaging, stepping out in faith, giving our lives to a greater purpose and a greater cause. I love that this story was included in Acts just for that moment, just for that time. And I wonder, what do you think God is preparing for you in this moment, in this time? You know, at each of the times we get together, we invite you to ask a question. We invite you to consider how God might want you to respond. The questions are this, what is God saying? And what am I going to do about it? You know, over the course of our Blueprint series, we've invited you to step into a few spaces. Step into authenticity, 
Step into community. Step into serving beyond yourselves, but also stepping into generosity. And last weekend, I, I challenged you to consider how God might be inviting you in, how he might be inviting you to, to consider what he might have you do and step into that space and you know what I believe? I believe that when we're obedient, when we take a step of courage, when we hold God's hand, when we respond to the spirit, he does not let us down. <laughs> he invites us to more. And can you imagine that moment that Peter and John had never experienced before and they stepped out and God inspired them and they, and they listened to that spirit's prodding and they did it and they healed somebody. Can you imagine what they were doing after they, can you imagine when they, they went to the temple and think, you're excited, you can't believe how excited I am. You're amazed, you can't believe how amazed I am. That must have been absolutely infusing. And do you think they wanted to do it again? They absolutely wanted to do it again. And their impact is all over the gospels of how these two uneducated, ordinary men allowed the spirit of God to work in their hearts and their minds and they made an impact beyond what they could ever imagine. And I wonder if that can be you too. You know, so as you consider how you might respond today, we're gonna invite the prayer team up here and, and maybe for you, it's taking a step of faith and step of courage and you're just gonna come up to that prayer team member and you say like, hey, I don't know but I want to listen to the Spirit's response. I, I, I want to take that step of courage. And maybe for you, it's baptism. Maybe you saw these baptism stories and you're like, I know for a long time, like Rianne, she goes like, I just it felt so alone, but I'm not going to be alone anymore. I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to do this and I'm going to start responding to the Spirit's lead in my life. Or maybe for you, it's authenticity that, that you're going to come out from behind yourself and you're going to start speaking truth and you're going to start opening your heart and your mind to others and, and sharing abundantly. Or maybe for you, it's knowing that you, you've rejected community. You've just come in the darkness and you left in the darkness or you come into church and you leave immediately after church and you haven't had the courage to step out beyond yourself and go, you know what? I need you and you need me and we're going to invest in that. Or maybe for you, it's stepping out beyond the finances you see on the paper and trusting God for generosity. And for you, you're celebrating what God inspired you to do today. And today, you're so excited to give. Today, you're so invited to say, hey, God, I'm believing this because I know you've called me to it. And I don't do it with an angry heart or an upset heart. I do it out of joyful cheer and awesome uh, expression of who I am because of who you are. So I don't know what it's going to be for you today, but I do know that the Spirit's here, and he's moving, and he's inviting. But most of all, he's reminding us of who he is. Would you stand with me? You know, as the prayer team comes up, you can come up anytime. They would love to pray for you or with you. I don't know, maybe it's a name. Maybe it's a name of a person that you just need to pray for in this season. Because we're going to sing two songs here. Just reminding us of who God is and what he's done. There's songs of gratitude. There's songs of praise. And my hope for you today is no matter your circumstance or situation, that your heart can overwhelm for gratitude for what God has done for you, what God's done for me, and what he wants to do through you in the days to come.
promise today. I hope you go into this Thanksgiving weekend full of that gratitude and that promise and that hope and that belief that God wants to do something through you. And if you have the courage to step out, he will do just that. What a promise that none of us are excluded. All of us are welcome. What I would encourage you to uh, spend some time uh, sharing the love after a service, meeting people, saying hi to them. Maybe you want to stop for a coffee or cinnamon bun, or maybe you're sprinting away to a turkey dinner. I don't know. But what I do know is that God's invited us into this moment as a faith community united. And so I encourage you, maybe you want to bring somebody back next week, maybe for the first time in Experience Church. We're launching a brand new series called The Survival Guide to Parenting. It's going to be a powerful time together as we just invest in each other and our families and building better families. And if this is a weekend where you said, hey, you know what, I'm stepping in faith and giving, I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, we didn't pass the buckets around, but we got digital out, uh, and you're more than welcome, or online, and we're just believing for God and great things and how he wants to show up in your life, so I encourage you to do that. But I want to give you a blessing out of Romans chapter 15 as we go. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you complete with, completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. Have a great night.